My goodness. Thank you so much for coming. I had no idea there were so many fans of the big pipes. So, I'm Andrew. Um, we're going to take a quick uh, dive into Scotland's hidden underground hydroelectric infrastructure. I hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Um, so first, a little disclaimer. Um, this is me several years ago, uh, standing next to one of the outlet valves at Malurdock Dam. And you will notice um, that I do not have a hard hat on, I'm not wearing a high-vis jacket, and I have a somewhat nonchalant pose. This means I'm not really meant to be there, because I'm not a civil engineer. I've never worked on the hydro schemes. Um, and I'm not really qualified in any way, but I hope that my enthusiasm for the big pipes uh, makes up for my lack of actual experience working on them. Okay, so first, I'm going to have to address the elephant in the room here. Uh, to me, this is a loch. To many of you, this is a lake. I understand this. So when the nice man on stage says the word loch, and I will say the word loch many times over the next half an hour, I want you to hear the word lake in your heads. And if you can do this, you will absolutely understand. However, I know that some of you are going to try to appease me, and you're going to call it a loch. It is not a loch. That is okay. But I really appreciate the effort. <clears throat> okay, so um, this is Loch Tummel. Um, this is in sort of the southern part of uh, the Highlands of Scotland. Uh, it's very scenic, taken on an unusually sunny day. Um, a lot of people come to visit. This is taken from a small viewpoint. And there's a cafe there and all sorts of other good stuff. It's about eight miles long and about one mile wide at its widest point. So we'll rock it about 20 miles north to Loch Aricht. It's a bit more typical of the kind of locks we have in Scotland. It's a bit more moody and dark. It's like 14 miles long. Again, it's about one mile wide at its widest point. And we have lots of bodies of water like this up in Scotland. And uh, Loch Tumble that we just saw, and Loch Arist, they have something in common. And this thing they have in common, in fact, many of the locks, lakes, uh, that we have in Scotland uh, share. And that is that they are lies. <laughs> These locks are actually part of a series of massive cascaded hydroelectric schemes. So here's the Tomo Gary scheme. Um, and if I just get my laser pointer on the go, you can see that's Loch Tunnel just at the bottom there. And we've got Loch Erecht up the top that we were just looking at. And you can see that these locks are all interconnected by a series um, of tunnels and aqueducts. Every pink dot there on this map for this one scheme is a power station with the water flowing downhill through the power station, turning a turbine, generating electricity. Now we have 10 of these massive schemes in Scotland, 54 power stations, 78 large dams, and over 300 kilometres of tunnels, shafts, underground generating stations, and lots of cool infrastructure that's just hidden up there away in the glens. Now, um, all this stuff uh, after our whole series of upgrades that they did uh, around the early 2000s is all remote controlled now uh, from a town called Perth. And this is super interesting to someone like me because it means that we have all of this cool infrastructure up there. And if you want to go and visit it, if you want to go and explore it perhaps, there's not that many people around to get in your way. And this can be quite interesting. So just in case you don't believe me, here's Loch Treig, dewatered, well, almost. Um, I didn't know this was going to happen, I just crested the dam one day, and I was like, whoa, where's Loch Tree? It's just a muddy pit. And when they dewater a lock for maintenance, um, it uncovers a lot of the structures that they've built in the lock. In this case, it uncovered, um, this is the outfall from the Lagan Tree Tunnel, it's the seven mile tunnel, which connects Loch Lagan to Loch Tree, and they use Loch Lagan as like a backup store for when Loch League has been drawn down. We just closed the gate, you can see it's still under pressure, we have water behind there. It's not quite sealing at the base and all that water is jetting out. We have a little human there for scale, just to give you sort of an idea of the scale of the stuff that we're talking about. So let's quickly talk about how it works. How do the big pipes actually work? Talk about the basic parts of the hydroelectric scheme. We're going to have a look at some of the social history about how we have all this amazing infrastructure up there. So I think that's super interesting. And then we'll have a look at some of my favourite uh, stations and dams and why they're significant. And if you've got time, we might go on and talk a little bit about pump storage. So this is like a very basic diagram of a hydroelectric scheme, how it works. And the first thing we have to ask ourselves really is what is hydro? Um, well, hydro is just capturing the potential energy stored in water as it falls downhill. Because the thing to remember about water 
It's actually really, really heavy stuff. A cubic meter of water, it's a thousand kilograms, it's a ton. A cubic meter of granite, granite the rock, it's 2,700 kilograms. Water is more than a third as heavy as granite. And we can store massive amounts of it up high, all that potential energy stored there, we can capture it as it flows downhill. So the first part really is the dam. Um, this is Sloy Dam, one of the first dams built by the Hydro Board, built in 1950. Um, it's now a listed structure, it's very architecturally significant. I think it's quite beautiful, I appreciate it, it's not to everyone's taste, but it's quite remote and if you go there, it's a very moody place. It's a great example of a gravity buttress dam. And what this basically just means is that it's the weight, it's the mass of the structure itself which holds it in place. So it's not really transferring any load to the rock to the right and the left there. Um, it's 357 meters long, 56 meters high. Just to give you a sense of scale, it's me standing inside one of the buttresses. It's not fenced off or anything in any way. You can take a walk up there, up the glen if you want. Go and hang around. There's some really cool acoustics if you stand in the middle of these buttresses. So Sloy Dam and Pounds Loch Sloy behind it. So we've got 36 million tons of water stored in Loch Sloy when it's full. It's about a 240 meter head. It's basically the vertical distance between the surface of the loch and the turbines that the water flows through. The more head we have, the more height, the more energy we can capture from the water. Now if you look very closely here, just up there, you'll see there's some water flowing into the loch. But if you look above it, there's not any evidence of that water actually flowing downhill. Um, and this is because that is the outfall from a massive network of other pipes and intakes that actually expands the catchment area of Loch Sloy from six miles, six square miles, to 17 square miles. And all of the hydro schemes are kind of like this. We have these big networks of underground tunnels which capture water from all the glens around about so we can store more water and thus more energy in the loch. So a couple of quick historical pictures here. Um, I like looking back at the history of how all these things were built. Um, if we zoom right in, uh, there are some guys working on one of the buttresses on Sloy Dam that we just saw. No health and safety back then, just clinging on for dear life, 56 metres up in the air. There was quite a significant loss of life uh, when they started to build these schemes, but by the time they reached sort of the, the middle 70s, they were finishing them off, health and safety had actually gotten pretty good. They had their hard hats and their ropes and things. Loss of life was quite low. Okay, so that's the dam. Next thing next, we've got the tunnel. So you need a big tunnel to bring all this water um, from your dam uh, eventually down to your power station. The tunnel is generally built on the level uh, for many miles. In Scotland, it's generally hewn through solid rock. To give you a sense of scale, here's a section uh, of the Clooney Tunnel. Um, this actually is built as a monument at the Clooney Power Station um, for five guys who died when they were building the tunnel. Fortunately, they had a lightning strike um, and the narrow gauge railway track that was running up the tunnel to the blasting face conducted the energy up and it detonated some explosives that they were wiring at the time and they died instantly. So, because it was such a large loss of life in one incident, they built this memorial to them. But again, it just gives you a sense of scale. It's about 7 metres wide, about 11 metres tall. So the next thing is a surge shaft. Now, I like a good surge shaft. These are uh, generally very large structures. And the surge shaft is there uh, to alleviate the effects of water hammer. The thing about water is it's very heavy, but it doesn't really compress. So when you have a big body of water in a tunnel moving towards your power station, if you close the valve at the power station to shut off that water, the water doesn't really compress, but you have all the inertia of the water moving towards you, and that energy needs to be dissipated somewhere. And it could just be dissipated in your tunnel structure and your valve, and everything would get completely destroyed. But instead, we have these big open air shafts, and we, we, the energy basically forces the column of water up the shaft, and it's dissipated that way. So this one's over at Foyers by Loch Ness, 27 metres diameter, about 50 odd metres deep. It's really massive when you go there, this picture doesn't really do it, do it justice. Press your face against the fence and shout echo again and again. Um, so I managed to find a video of a surge shaft in operation. Um, this one's not in Scotland unfortunately, but it's, it's kind of a similar size, it's a little bit smaller. It's from the El Torito power plant in Costa Rica, it's a 50 megawatt turbine trip. So they, they trip the turbine, which means they shut it down very fast. You've got a huge column of water moving towards them, and then it all boils up in the shaft. And I just find this absolutely terrifying to watch this. You can imagine stuck in there, falling in there. If the camera pans up, you're going to see a gantry around the top. It sort of gives you a sense of scale. The guy filming it's quite excited about it. 
I think it's quite rare for them to trip out a turbine so fast. Definitely not something you'd want to be following, for sure. So you get the idea. So the next part is going to be our valve house. And the valve house is basically a transition between your big underground water tunnel to your penstocks. And your penstocks are these high pressure steel pipelines that will run downhill um, to the powerhouse itself. Um, the later schemes that the Hydro Board uh, built in Scotland, their tunnelling technology had massively improved and they were able to put everything underground. Um, and those are the schemes that I'm quite interested in because, let's face it, underground stuff, all that James Bond layers, it's all quite cool. So quick look inside the valve house at Sloy, you can see four big butterfly valves there. And if you look back actually, you can see they've got a little railway track built on the right hand side. Um, and that's basically because the slope is so steep, they've got a big rail cart inside that they winch up and down to get materials in and out. So next, the penstocks. The penstocks, as I said, are these high pressure pipelines that run downhill. Here's some big pipes going down to Sloy Power Station, about right, nine feet diameter at the top, narrowing to about seven feet diameter down at the base. 400 PSI water pressure. It's about two inch thick steel. If you haven't had the operation, it's about 50, 55 mil, give or take. Um, yeah, about 27 atmospheres of pressure. So a lot of energy contained in this system. So here's a view looking up the hill to those pipes. If you notice, the pipes are anchored in place by these huge concrete blocks. Because of course these pipes, they want to unkink themselves when they're under pressure like that. They have to put these massive concrete blocks molded around them to hold them in place. And the biggest one on the Sloy scheme is 3,600 tonnes. Another little historical photograph here, and you can see this is the guys actually building the shuttering about that to pour the concrete to hold the pipes in place. So finally we've got our powerhouse and our, our tail race. Um, as I said, the earlier schemes that the board built were all above ground, and then the later ones were all below ground. But for the above ground schemes, their powerhouses are really nice, they're all made out of natural stone, they're very big, bright, airy structures. They really took a Victorian view to this engineering, where they felt like you know, it should be appreciated and admired. There's a quick cut through of Sloy Station here, just to give you an idea of what's going on. You have your water coming in, there from um, the bottom left, going through your main inlet valve and falling through this Francis turbine, which is just a particular type of hydro turbine. And then you have a massive generator set on top. So the water falling through the turbine spins the generator and we get electricity from that. Shouldn't underestimate really uh, the trouble they went to to build the stations. I mean, even for Sloy, um, they had to excavate 37,000 tonnes of rock just to bed in the foundations for the, uh, the turbines themselves. So, this is Finlarry Power Station, nothing too special here, but just an example of how they build them nice. It's not even a particular uh, sort of station that you would see, it's not right next to a busy road. Um, you'd have to really go and look for this to find it. But you can see the grounds are all well landscaped. They have all these lovely big wooden doors. They have the name of the power station generally on top above the doors in the rock. This is Fuznackle. Um, and if you look closely, you even see the, the lighting globes either side of the door. These are lovely glass spheres with sort of raw iron hands holding them in place. Okay, so um, that's just a brief overview of how the hydro actually works. Now we need to jump back in time, have a little history lesson, because the history of how all this stuff was built is super interesting. And even though I'm a techie kind of guy, I would say it's almost more interesting than the actual infrastructure itself. So the Highlands of Scotland basically is the area there um, in dark green. And the Highlands at the turn of the last century had a massive problem. And that problem was depopulation. It was a tough life, mostly subsistence farming, which is what we call crofting. Not really any industry to speak of. Um, very little public investment for about 200 years. People are, you know, cooking on peat. They're lighting their homes with paraffin and oil lamps. And they're leaving because the quality of life is not good. There's not a lot of economic opportunity. Um, so the population fell by about 15% between 1921 and 1951. Why? Well, why was there not that much investment like in building out an electrical grid? Because it was uneconomical, that's why. You've got 16,000 square miles of rugged terrain. It's about 25% of the land mass of Great Britain. At the time, only 3% of the population. It just wasn't worth doing. So estimates have it, before the hydro came along, only about 1% of homes had any form of electrical power at all. There certainly wasn't an electrical distribution grid. So, enter Tom Johnston. Now Tom is a personal hero of mine, and if I could go back in time to speak to anyone in history, it would be Tom. Um, I think he did so much for the country, and everything that I've read about him shows me that he really was a kind and humble man. And he was a career politician in a time uh, where being a politician really meant doing the right thing for the people that you serve. 
So he was Secretary of State for Scotland between 1941 and 1945. And his legacy really was the formation of the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board um, and the resulting electrification of the Highlands. Now, um, a quick story for you here uh, about how he was actually able to do this, because there had been attempts in the past and they, they had failed. Um, so when Winston Churchill asked Tom to be Secretary of State for Scotland, um, Tom was quite a wily political guy, and um, he said to Churchill, well, I'll take the job, I'll do it, but I want to form something called the Council of State. So the Council of State was to be every surviving Secretary of State for Scotland, of which there were five members, across the political divide, left and right. Um, Tom was, was Labour, so he was left wing. Um, and Tom said to Churchill, he said, if I bring an issue to you from our Council of State and we are in unanimous agreement, I want you to back the issue, help me push whatever bills I need through Parliament. The story goes that Churchill sat for a full 30 seconds in silence and then snorted and said, yes, what next? And that was it. Tom had it. He was essentially bestowed with the powers of a benign dictator if he could get agreement from his Council of State. And in Tom's memoirs, um, he says, and this is a quote, it's somewhat wordy, um, I do wonder if he's taken some poetic license here, uh, but as he was walking away from that meeting in Churchill, um, in London with Churchill, he thought, I will have a jolly good try at a public corporation on a non-profit basis to harness the Highland water power for electricity. And so we did. So we have the Hydroelectric Development Scotland Bill, 1943, which established the North of Scotland Hydroelectric Board, which we affectionately call the Hydro. So they were to be a fully government-owned, arm's-length, not-for-profit body to develop the hydropower resources of Scotland to improve the quality of life, attract industry and help stem outward migration. So this was a highly innovative structure, it was a not-for-profit body and they had social good clauses um, in their charter. Oh. Okay, so um, let's get to a picture of Plockton, it's a little village on the west coast in the 1950s. Um, and if we look closely, we can see the hint of an electric light up at the top. Um, we've got a little electric kettle plugged in over there, uh, next to the picture of Winston Churchill. But they don't trust this newfangled electric quite yet, because they've still got the copper one by the fire, just in case. Here we've got a cooker being delivered uh, by boat across a lock in Scotland. We can tell it's Scotland, because there's a man in a kilt. Um, but, you know, this is a momentous occasion. Uh, the electric is arriving. Um, it's something to be, to be noted. We don't know exactly where this is, but it is in Scotland. Um, we've got another cooper being delivered to a croft. And if you look very closely, you'll see that the, the van delivering it has the hydroelectric board on the side. And that's because the hydro board didn't just build out the generation, they actually built out the, um, the, sort of the consumption as well, um, the demand. Um, and basically they had a network of shops that sold appliances. Uh, by 1968, they'd sold over two million pounds of appliances. Uh, they even had a full-time cook who travelled giving cooking demonstrations to these newly electrified villages. Um, and they invested heavily in electrified farm machinery to try and get these crofters uh, more efficient with their farms. So by 1970, they brought power to over 96% of potential customers in the Highlands. Now this little electrical map that you see is not actually quite of the Highlands, it's in the northeast, but the Hydro Board had responsibility for that zone. And you'll see on the left in 1948, um, they had barely any electrical grid, and then by 1960, you have this massive network of high voltage lines built out. So they are regarded as a, a highly innovative success story of a not-for-profit organisation with a social good aim. Now, on the history side, I'm going to leave you with a quote here um, from, oh, apologies for that, uh, from a lady called Emma Wood, who wrote a book called The Hydro Boys. Um, okay. Uh, and she says, in the three decades following the Second World War, the Hydro Board's teams of planners, engineers and architects succeeded in creating an epic succession of schemes that were world-renowned, not only for successfully achieving their technical aims in very demanding terrain, but for doing so in an aesthetically inspiring manner. The economic and social benefits thus brought to the people of Scotland, and especially those in rural, rural areas, were immense and long-lasting. So I think we are uh, slowly running out of time, so I'm actually going to just skip over for a few of those last slides about the history. And we're going to go underground, and we're going to talk about some of my favourite hydro infrastructure and look at some pictures of the big pipes. So, um, 
Let's rock it up north. Uh, we're going to go just west of Inverness um, and we're going to talk about the Afric Bewley scheme. Six stations on the scheme, of which my favourite is Dini because it's a complicated little beast. Uh, we have seven major dams, of which my favourite is Minar because it's the network's only double curved arch dam and um, was the biggest one in the world when it was built. And we also have Malurdoch, uh, which has a little afterthought station next to it. Now, if you look closely, I don't know if you can see it on the projector, but hopefully you can, um, some of the pink dots have a little black dot in them, and that means that these are the underground stations that the hydro board built. Um, and, you know, this uh, Afric Bully scheme was built later on in the 60s, where their tunneling technology had improved, um, and they were able to do this sort of, uh, it was a nice, nice, aesthetically pleasing thing to do. Um, so this is Malurdoch Dam. Uh, it's up a closed glen, um, so you have to cycle a walk about 15 miles to get there. I um, won't say too much about the dam, but it was the longest the hydro board built. Um, but you'll find this little structure next to it. And this, in fact, is the entrance to the afterthought power station that they built. Super interesting station because they built it three years after they built the dam. And they were like, oh, there's 25 meters of level difference between um, Malordoch and the other lock that we feed. And being the canny Scots that they are, they were like, well, that's money down the tubes. We're going to build a little station there, capture some of that energy. Um, quick plan of Malurdo Station, I'm just going to skip over that. But if you were to go in that building and look down the shaft, uh, you would see an old slam door lift just there and a nice emergency escape ladder. Now, um, when they renovated the station, they improved the escape ladder a little bit. Um, but many, many years ago, uh, I was fortunate enough to be inside uh, and I took a wee video looking down the escape ladder. And as I was prone to do back in the day, I have narrated these videos. I'm not sure why, uh, but it's something that you'll have to endure. But it's just a few seconds long, and uh, we'll just have a look inside the station itself. All right, so here we have the lift, which we can, in theory, take down. And if we go in here, we'll pop the hatch. It's a long way down. Very happy. We have some uh, fall arresters here as well, some harnesses and stuff. Okay, so looking down. So, if you go down that ladder, you will then be inside the station itself. Um, it's an interesting station because they, uh, as I'm about to narrate to you, um, they didn't have a lot of room when they built it because it was an afterthought station. No horizontal access, you can't get any vehicles in. Um, so they built a big gearbox and they put the generator off to the side of the turbine. To the generator, so you can just about see, I mean it's very noisy in there, very noisy. Um, the generator is in the foreground, uh, fortunately the camera angles, yeah there we go. So that's actually spinning right now, generating current, it's around 2 megawatts. And that big blue box you see behind it, that's actually a ginormous gearbox which is um, taking the drive from the turbines through 90 degrees and into the generator. Okay, just gives you a sense of what that little station is like. It's very small, and it's just a single room that's down this big shaft. Okay, so uh, let's rock it up to uh, the Minar Dam, uh, which is the farthest north one there on the scheme. Now, Minar is a really cool structure if you're there. Um, it's a double curved arch dam, which basically means it's kind of like uh, the side of a, of a sphere, right? So if you're standing there at the base of the dam, not only do you have it curving away to your right and your left, you've got it curving over your head as well as you look up. It's Britain's only double curved arch dam, built in 1962, attracted interest from all over the world as the largest double curved arch dam built at the time. Now, um, the reason these are good is because they transfer the load well to the rock either side of the dam and they use a lot less concrete than if you're building a big uh, gravity dam as well. In fact, uh, Menorah Dam here is only 12 feet thick in places at the top, which is like orders of magnitude less than you would find with other dams. It enlarged Loch Menorah by about six miles at the time um, and it was a really high amenity area, it was very beautiful, so it was quite controversial when it was built. If you look up the dam, you'll see that it's got some gantries on it, which is not very typical for Scotland. That's because they festooned it with lots of strain gauges and sensors when they built it, um, because they wanted to know how the structure was going to behave, because it was a very new, innovative design at the time. So next to the dam, you're going to get this cool, brutalist building here. This is your intake structure for the Deeney Tunnel. Um, I really like how these structures look, because uh, they really contrast the landscape around them. I think they're quite beautiful. I appreciate it's not to everyone's taste, um, but they are mostly listed these days as well. So this intake structure here um, basically has uh, some trash screens down underwater and they would actually take all the trash that would build up at the intake, um, like logs and trees and things, drag it up the top there and it would sort of be emptied out into a gantry and then removed. If you're inside the intake structure, you're going to see a huge stop log gate. Now, a stop log gate is something that we basically lower down 
a shaft to block off the tunnel, and it's just these massive solid steel rollers which are fully greased, um, and as they roll down the, the tunnel into the path of the water, they compress and they seal off the tunnel if you need to dewater it all for maintenance. Okay, so Dini Power Station. Um, this is a little gem of a station, it really is. They were getting creative when they started to build these. Um, so at the top left there you've got Menar Dam, where we just were, um, and there you've basically got uh, a long tunnel which brings water to the bottom of the surge shaft, which is also completely subterranean now as well. It's not open at the top, you just have a big vent in the hill. Um, there's a lot of side intake structures bringing water from all over the different glens. And then it drops into an underground high pressure shaft. So we don't have any of those big steel pen stocks anymore on the side of the hill. And then we're into the station proper. Um, and then if you notice very carefully, around about here, you also have a downstream surge shaft as well. Um, and that's because Dini is one of the only stations that has a pressure, a pressurized tail race, where um, the water is actually right to the roof of the tunnel, it's coming out under pressure, um, so you need something to alleviate the effects of water hammer as well. If you look very closely, you can see that there's a ventilation shaft going into the top of that surge shaft, and it's cross-linked to the top of Dini station as well. So, walk along the road in this remote glen, you might see a structure like this. That might be the entrance to the ventilation shaft. And if you chose to go down that shaft, you might find yourself at the top of the surge shaft. You could transition around the top of it, and then you could climb a little ladder. You could go into another tunnel, which is just out of sight at the back of the shot there. And you would find yourself in Dini Power Station. And you would actually just drop out of this area, just up here. So once you're in the station, you're going to see something like this. You've got your two big gen sets, built in 1963, 38 megawatts total. Um, and you know, for most of the time this is unmanned, just happily purrs away underground, buried underneath the mountain up in Scotland. Um, so we're quickly just going to talk about pump storage. That really is the future uh, for hydro in Scotland. Um, we've really had a long time where there was no investment in hydroelectric infrastructure. But now that we have all these renewables connected to the grid, uh, we need a way to store this energy. Now the interesting thing about pump storage um, is that... Thanks. Um, pump storage still really is... Um, the only way to store large amounts of energy that you can access quickly and connect to the grid. Uh, so just as a point of reference, um, I'm just going to get my notes back there. Yeah, so at Kurikan, which is our biggest pump storage scheme currently in Scotland, but not the biggest in the UK, and it's not even a particularly big station in the grand scheme of things, it's got 6,600 megawatt hours of stored energy. And our biggest grid connected lithium battery is down at Pillswood, um, and that's only 198 megawatt hours. So 33 times more capacity we've got even in a small pump storage scheme. Um, so pump storage is when you're, you're pumping water uphill um, in nighttime or when you've got excess energy and then you're letting it flow back downhill when you actually need to capture the energy. Um, so here's Kurikan, you can see the reservoir up top there. It was built in 1959 in tandem with the Hunterston A nuclear station to store the excess energy that it uh, would produce. Um, it was really innovative for its time because Kurikan was actually the first reversible pump storage station um, where basically they were using the same turbines and generators to pump water back uphill. And it's incredibly powerful. It can shift over 200 tonnes of water a second back up to the upper loch. Um, pedal to the metal, running the station at full load, they can run for about 15 hours. Um, but actually, contractually, they're obliged to keep 10 hours of capacity in reserve at all times because Kurikan is critical to Operation Black Star which is how we would bring the grid back online if we had a nationwide grid blackout. <laughs> so here's Kruken Station itself. It's much bigger than Dini. Dini would fit many times just in the main machine hall there. Um, I'm not going to run you through what everything does, but at Kruken you can take a tour down. It's the only one you can publicly access. They'll drive you down uh, the shaft on the bus and you can have a look at the main machine hall. And someone who does wear high vis uh, will show you around. Um, so, I'm probably just going to close off now because I think I'm about to run out of time uh, with a quick video, which is going to be a little drone fly through into Kurikan that um, SSE, uh, which is what the Hydro Board became, um, released a few years ago. Uh, not my music, but at least it gives you a sense of scale of the station and what they're building. You'll pass the bus full of tourists as you fly down the tunnel. There they go. So, super dramatic. Um, 
anyway, uh, there's so much more that I could talk to you about this and the development of pump storage and the future that we're going to have uh, up in Scotland. There's a lot more that's going to be built. Um, no time for that, though. So I've been Andrew. This has been Big Pipes. I hope you've enjoyed it.